Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to have everyone back for another uh, seminar in our uh, Gondo seminar series. And uh, this week, we are very fortunate to have Simon Shamai Tsuri from uh, Haifa University Psychology Department, who does very, very interesting work and very exciting work on uh, social aspects such as empathy. Uh, she's done some exciting work on the role of oxytocin in uh, mediating uh, social behaviors. And I'm very curious that I've been uh, looking at uh, following this project now for a while uh, to see your work on uh, how we can see what's happening with a few brains that interact together. So Simon, the stage is yours. Thank you, Roy. Hi, everyone. Really happy to see many familiar faces here. Um, let me share the screen. Um, okay, so um, I would like to share with you a few insights from our lab about uh, the neural and, uh, underpinning of empathy. And as uh, Roy mentioned, I will mainly focus on a two brain approach that views two brain as part of a feedback loop that allows us to understand and feel each other um, emotions. So first, I would like to thank um, my uh, collaborators, the funding agencies, and the students that participated in uh, running the experiments that I will present. Um, so when we think of empathy, there are many um, different terms that are related to empathy, some of which are more emotional, like emotional contagion or identification, which is basically our tendency to feel and share other people's emotions. Other terms that relate to empathy are more cognitive, like perspective taking, which is basically our tendency to take someone else's perspective uh, and understand what they are feeling, what they are thinking, what they understand their beliefs without actual sharing. So many theoretical framework address empathy more as a, an emotional system and other uh, address empathy is a cognitive uh, system that uh, allows us to understand other people's emotion. But most models, recent model of empathy, argue that both emotional and cognitive empathy are uh, working together uh, uh, to allow us to understand and share other people's emotions. Empathy uh, occurs every day, all the time, in dyadic interaction, in group interaction, in positive emotion when we share the joy of others. Um, in negative situation when we feel someone else uh, distress or pain um, across the lifespan in uh, adolescent, in uh, childhood, in adulthood, uh, and, and, and indoors, outdoors, it occurs every day, all the time, in, in almost every social interaction. And I have here a short clip to demonstrate the dynamic uh, nature of empathy and how it involved this feedback loop between a target and an observer. <laughs> These are two siblings. Oh, no. One is experiencing distress. Okay, so, yeah. so we see here, yeah, sibling, one is experiencing distress, her brother is trying to console her. Uh, he's, he's, he tries one strategy, like caressing her, kissing her, and doesn't work. Then he, he attempts to uh, apply another strategy, he helps her. And finally, we see uh, uh, that she's going back to homeostasis. Now she's calm and happy. And, and this is a nice demonstration. I like this clip because it, it demonstrates this dynamic aspect of empathy, this trial and error between a, a target experiencing distress and an observer that attempt to uh, diminish the level of distress and, uh, and allowing a return to homeostasis. And there are many other examples, but I think this example is enough. So the question how to examine this uh, very complicated behavior this interplay between the target and observer in the lab. How can we examine the, the mechanism that underlie this behavior? And unfortunately, uh, many neuroimaging studies um, are extremely limited because they examine isolated agents, uh, usually participants lying in the scanner, 
uh, performing a computerized task with socially in, uh, and sensory deprived environment with no real face-to-face -face interaction. And there are basically two main limitations for the, uh, those traditional uh, paradigm. One is person limitation and the other is situation limitation. The person limitation is basically uh, uh, the lack of movement that you see in most cognitive uh, paradigm uh, available in the literature. When we limit the activity or the ability of the uh, participant to be an active agent in the situation, we basically interfere with the sense of embodiment or the sense of agency. And we know that embodiment is an important part of our uh, cognitive processing. And, and, and perhaps it uh, changed the basic foundation of uh, emotions of, uh, of the participant that uh, performed this, this uh, type of uh, paradigms. Uh, the situation dependent uh, limitation is basically related to the artificial context that we have in most paradigm in cognitive neuroscience. Usually we uh, carry out our experiment in the lab, in very controlled environment, uh, and in social neuroscience when we actually uh, seek to understand social processes, we ask participants to observe still pictures uh, and computerized type with no real social agent. So um, um, the question remains is how can we really understand social processes when we don't really examine uh, um, interaction with real social agents? So the traditional approach suggests that we should actually look at control experiment in computerized tasks. And a new uh, approach in neuroscience, in social neuroscience, uh, which is termed the two brain approach, suggests that we should start looking at real life interaction with face-to-face -face interaction and measure brain and behavior of uh, real life interaction. And the hardcore real life approach suggests that we should actually uh, take our experiment outside the lab uh, to vivid and real life uh, uh, environment with dyads groups uh, and, and uh, with uh, real social interaction with no interference. And this student brain approach suggested uh, we should look at a brain signal of both participants simultaneously. And it uses a, a technique or a new method that is called hyperscanning. Hyperscanning is a term uh, coined by uh, Reed Montig uh, in 2002, which is, and, and this term basically represents uh, the ability to measure brain activity of two or more individuals simultaneously allowing uh, examination of the information fl flow from one individual to the other. And according to this uh, approach, we should not only look at, at intra-brain connection, but also to look at inter-brain connection. And if intra-brain connection basically represent a connection between two brain regions uh, in a network, and it could be a functional network or a, a structural network, but, but, but even in a functional network, uh, we believe that uh, those networks are mediated by physical connection. However, these interbrain networks are not really anatomical network, but rather a, a correlation between activity of two regions that is uh, probably uh, mediated by sensory um, input. So um, this new approach that suggests that if until now neuroscience focused on understanding uh, changes that occurs in synapses, brain structures, and um, functional or structural network, we should move, neuroscience should move into uh, looking at uh, interbrain network and changes in this network that are related to social behavior. So in the context of empathy, uh, if uh, the study of empathy until now focused on looking at one response of an empathizer to uh, a target, which is basically an open loop approach that views how one responds to the other, the new feedback loop uh, approach suggests that we should not only look at how uh, the empathizer uh, reacts to the target, but also how uh, um, the target reacts back to the empathizer based on feedback. And, and this uh, 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 suggests that perhaps that some sort of mutual alignment occurs between the empathizer and the target. 
Um, now, the importance of empathy uh, and, and, and synchrony in uh, empathic interaction have been demonstrated in many contexts. This is a, a nice study that uh, was um, published by a clinical psychologist um, that uh, examine uh, synchrony between a therapist and a client during real life uh, therapeutic interaction. We can see uh, this is a real film in the dark. It, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, this is the client, this is the psychotherapist. And uh, Ramsayer and his colleague measured using a video algorithm analysis measured changes in pixel between the right side of the screen and the left side of the screen which is basically a, a measurement of a, a synchrony movement, how much gross movement occurs, movement synchrony occurs between patient and client. And they show nicely that the level of synchrony between the patient and the client predicted the level of empathy experienced by the uh, psychotherapist. But mo most importantly, they showed that the level of synchrony predicted uh, the outcome of psychotherapy such that a higher level of synchrony between the client and the psychotherapist predicted better outcome of psychotherapy. So this is a nice example of how um, this uh, feedback loop between the client and the uh, uh, therapist is important in the context of psychotherapy. In my lab, we, uh, in one of the experiments, we thought to examine uh, whether oxytocin uh, regulates level of synchrony in movement of dyads. Um, mm. When we carried out this experiment, we didn't have um, a sophisticated uh, system for motion tracking system. So we used a system that, uh, a, a, the Etovision system, which is usually used by uh, people that work with rat models of movement. Um, so we asked the dyad of participant to wear those colorful hat and move in those designated rectangular, just move freely. And we had two groups, uh, one, uh, received before the movement oxytocin and the other received placebo and as you see here they just move um, freely in the in those designated rectangular we recruited the uh, friends uh, because we thought it would be <clears throat> a bit embarrassing to dance with a stranger and we calculated uh, synchrony in, ve in velocity of head movement uh, there was a camera attached to the ceiling and uh, we used the cost correlation uh, to calculate level of synchrony in the head movement. And um, as we can clearly see here from this figure, uh, the group that received placebo was uh, significantly higher in their tendency to synchronize during dance versus uh, the placebo group. And when we divided those groups, uh, we also measured their empathic abilities. And when we divided them to those with high and low versus low level of empathy, we can clearly see that only those with high level of empathy were mostly affected by the intranasal administration of oxytocin. So we can see that oxytocin increases synchrony in movement but mostly it works on uh, those that uh, have higher level of empathy, high level of trait empathy. Um, recently, we purchased a more sophisticated system to uh, track movement of participants. This, this system allows um, measuring a three-dimensional movement um, using markers attached to the body. Um, here we can see a dyad uh, uh, consisting of a teacher and a learner. Uh, the teacher is uh, teaching uh, Tai Chi movement uh, to the learner and um, we measure level of synchrony um, in their movement doing a learning Tai Chi movement and in this specific experiment we compared two conditions since we were interested in uh, um, examining the importance of synchrony to learning in this experiment, we um, designed a, a setup that allows comparing observational learning where the teacher can see, uh, the teacher cannot see the learner, but the learner can see the teacher. This is a one-way mirror, okay? So the learner can see the teacher, he can uh, learn the movement, but the teacher cannot see the learner. And in the second condition, 
we just have a transparent class. The learner can see the teacher, the teacher can see the learner. So this is basically a unidirectional learning when we learn, for example, Tai Chi from uh, YouTube or from videos. And, and this is a, a condition where there is a bidirectional interaction. The learner can see the teacher, the teacher can see the learner. And we compare these two conditions and we hypothesize that um, um, learning would be uh, much better in the bidirectional condition because uh, uh, there is signals, uh, signal communication from both uh, sides. And we can see here some preliminary results from this experiment showing that indeed this is the red uh, line demonstrate um, zero lag correlation. And we can see that uh, in, indeed in the bidirectional condition, uh, there is a um, higher level of synchrony between the teacher and the learner versus the unidirectional condition where there are only moment uh, of uh, synchrony between the teacher and the learner. So this is a, a, an example of how um, it is important to look at those feedback loop between uh, two individuals during social interaction. And if we go back to empathy, when we started to um, examine um, uh, empathy in those uh, real interaction, we looked for a, an empathic interaction that will have a direct effect on regulating uh, emotion, like we saw in the clip. We can see that there are some responses that uh, um, help to reduce stress. So we looked, uh, we, uh, uh, looked for an, uh, such a uh, response that will have a, a direct effect on regulating distress, and we decided to focus on social touch or consolation. In this uh, example, this is a very famous uh, picture from the book of Franz de Waal, a famous primatologist. And we can see here a juvenile chimpanzee putting his arm around a, an adult chimpanzee who was just defeated in a fight. And uh, Deval describes this console, consoling behavior as an empathic response that allows uh, reducing the distress of a, a suffering target. And consolation is documented not only in chimpanzees, but also in bonobos, even in elephants. In many types of rodents, we see grooming uh, as a strategy for uh, emotion regulation. And of course, in, uh, across all human culture, we see that people use touch uh, as a strategy for emotion regulation, for interpersonal emotion regulation, for regulating someone else's distress. We know that touch communicates emotion um, and touch uh, is important for reducing distress. And it has also been shown that it is uh, very good to communicate empathy. So when we started to look for um, um, ways to examine the effects of touch on pain, we first, uh, in a pilot study, sought to select a, a touch that has a direct effect on reducing pain. We carried out a pilot study when we asked participants uh, to choose one of three types of touch that reduce distress. Uh, one was slow stroking on the arm, which basically uh, uh, stimulates CT fibers, which is considered a pleasurable touch. Um, another condition was slow stroking on the palm. And the third condition was static hand holding. And do you, do you have a guess which type of uh, touch was selected by most of our participants as the best touch for? Uh, pain reduction. Hand holding. Static. Static? Yeah, correct response. <laughs> so we see that 75% of our sample uh, selected the static hand holding as a preferable touch. So we uh, uh, selected this touch uh, as our. Uh, method for emotion regulation. And in this experiment, in the first experiment carried out by Pavel Goldstein, my former PhD student, who now, now he has his own lab in Haifa. Um, and he thought to examine the, first to examine the analgestic effect of social touch, of hand-holding. And, uh, and importantly, he wanted to test the moderating role of uh, empathy in this effect of hand-holding and uh, analgesia. So in this experiment, we recruited 20 romantic couples 
uh, females and males, and uh, one of the participants was the target experiencing physical pain. We used the thermod attached to the arm to inflict pain. And uh, the other participant was uh, the regulator, and we had four conditions. One was partner no touch, one was partner touch, stranger task, we asked the participant to hold the hand of the uh, target, and alone, where the target was alone with no uh, social presence at all. As we can see here clearly from this figure, um, the lowest level of pain reported by the participant was during the partner touch. So this basically uh, uh, indicate that as we believe and we know before that the hand holding is the uh, contribute to pain reduction, but we can also see that uh, it is important to examine the identity of the toucher. Only touch uh, from a partner is effective as compared to touch from, from a stranger. Um, but I think that the most interesting finding in this, in this study was that when we measured the level of empathy of the toucher, we found that higher level of empathy predicted lower level of pain of the target. Okay, suggesting that participants with high level of empathy are better at reducing the level of pain of the target. Okay, so highly empathic partner perhaps are better at sensing the level of pain of the target, perhaps they are better at communicating uh, what they feel, uh, they are better at com comforting them and, and sensing uh, and, and adjusting uh, the, the touch based on what the uh, target is feeling. And this is perhaps why we found this uh, correlation between empathy of the uh, empathy of the toucher and level of pain of the target. And this was true only for the touch condition. Okay, only when there was hand holding condition. In the other condition, though, we didn't find such a correlation. We further sought to um, examine this uh, the neural uh, underpinning of this effect with a dual EEG system. Uh, so in this study, we uh, recruited again 20 romantic couple, new couple that did not participate in the previous experiment. Again, we uh, divided them into target, experiencing pain with the thermod attached to the arm, and an uh, uh, empathizer or toucher was instructed to either hold the hand of the target or just be present in the room. Um, we measured, we focused on the alpha mu band uh, because previous study have shown that uh, the alpha mu band is a good biomarker of empathy. We see alpha mu band in many studies that uh, uh, use um, uh, pictures of distress uh, uh, in computerized tasks. So, um, we looked, so we uh, extracted a uh, alpha band from each of the participants, from the target and the regulator, and we used the circular correlation, a method to measure level of synchrony between the alpha band. And now it, here in this figure, uh, we see the four condition that we had uh, when there was uh, no touch and no pain, uh, touch but no pain, and no touch pain and partner touch plus pain. Okay, this is the four combinations. Each line, yellow line here, represents a significant correlation after controlling for a uh, um, number of correlation with the uh, corrections. And we can see that the, uh, the highest number of correlation between the target and the toucher was in the pain touch condition. Okay, only when there was pain plus touch, this in this empathy condition, we see uh, 25 significant correlation. We see low level of uh, a low number of correlation in the partner, no touch, no pain. So this is just the presence condition. There was no touch and no pain, but still there is some correlation between between their brain activity. This is partner touch, no pain. Uh, with uh, 10 links, and here we see partner no touch pain uh, with uh, five links. Um, now, I, I think that this is the most interesting finding of this study because it shows that the, uh, the level of 
brain-to-brain uh, -brain synchrony predict the level of pain of the target. Okay, so we see that the higher level of synchrony between participants, brain-to-brain -brain synchrony, predicts lower level of pain. It means that uh, diets that are highly synchronized are better at regulating uh, the distress of the target. Okay, that this brain-to-brain -brain synchrony perhaps explain why uh, hand-holding reduces distress. In addition, we found that brain-to-brain uh, -brain synchrony also predicts level of empathy. A uh, higher level of brain-to-brain uh, -brain synchrony predicted level of empathy experienced by the toucher. So, um, so, so this uh, uh, finding basically indicates that uh, um, um, this brain-to-brain -brain synchrony perhaps is a mechanism for pain reduction during uh, hand-holding. We further sought to uh, examine this with the fMRI, uh, to examine the anatomical correlates of this effect. And this was Adi Koritsky, who is now uh, in Barilan. Um, and uh, this was her master thesis. Uh, and she uh, examined, uh, again, 20 romantic couples in, uh, in the scanner. Uh, they were randomly divided into target and empathizer. The target was inflicted with the high or low pain with a term or attached to the leg. Um, and we had the condition of hand holding versus uh, holding a rubber ball. So it was basically a two by two condition pain, no pain, hand holding, holding a rubber ball. Now, since we do not have a, a scanner, two connected scanner, we carried out a, a serial design. So um, in some, in half of the couples, we first scan the empathizer uh, and then the target, and in half of the in half of the uh, dyads, we first scan the uh, target and then we scan the empathizer. So we basically obtained both the scan of the empathizer and the target <coughs> in a serial design. So basically, we carried out the, the experiments twice for each dyad, and the only they switch rows. So it's not really a hyper scanning study, but we did have uh, scans of both the empathizer and the target. And this is the behavioral results. Uh, we can see that we basically replicated our previous finding that hand holding reduces pain. We can see that in high level of pain, hand holding uh, reduces the level of pain. Also in the low level, in the control condition, when, when it was low level of pain, also hand holding reduces. <clears throat> when we um, examined, we carried out the contrast analysis and compared the condition of handholding plus pain versus the other condition, we find remarkable shared activation between uh, the target and the empathizer. In both participants, we, find, we found uh, uh, activation in the inferior parietal lobe. In blue, we can see activation during hand holding and pain in the target. In blue, uh, in red, we can see the activation of the empathizer. And in pink or magenta, we can see uh, the shared activity between them. So we can see that during hand holding, there was remarkable shared activation in the same region. When, when we extracted beta value and carried out a correlation analysis, we, we found a significant correlation between brain activity of the target and the regulator or the controller and the console, such that higher activity in one participant predicted also higher uh, activity in the partner. So we see this seemingly uh, synchrony in the uh, inferior parietal lobe in the IPL during hand holding and pain, and, and we did not find this activity in the uh, other conditions. Now we know that the IPL is part of the um, observation execution system. We re recently suggested a, a model of uh, alignment, of social alignment, consisting of a three system, three system, observation execution, which is important, or mirror neuron system, which is important for um, 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 aligning and uh, observing and uh, preparing response. Uh, um, reward system, which signals that alignment was achieved. And um, a distress system, 
consisting of the anterior insula and uh, anterior cingulate, which is important for gap detection, detecting that there is a gap between uh, the self and the other. Okay, so these three systems are important for uh, aligning uh, in dyads and group. And in this experiment, we found that indeed uh, activity in the IPL predicted uh, uh, alignment. This, uh, IPL was also found in many studies to uh, be related to uh, empathy for pain. Uh, we also carried out a psychophysiological uh, 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 interaction analysis that allows identifying regions that are uh, uh, coupled with the activity of the IPL during handholding. And we found that during handholding and pain, uh, the IPL activity was positively coupled with activity of the uh, superior frontal gyros, a region that was found uh, in a previous study as uh, responsible for emotion regulation. So we concluded from both experiments that um, perhaps synchrony between the empathizer and the target, and particularly coupling in activity of the IPL perhaps activate, is responsible for activating frontal regions that are important for emotion regulation. And this loop allows better uh, emotion regulation in the target and allows uh, uh, um, reducing level of pain experience in the target. Um, any questions so far or should I continue? So, I have a question. Okay. Uh, the IPL region seems quite uh, near to the actual region where you expect to get some sensory effects from the touch. So I'm wondering whether you think this is part of how this is mediated actually, or does this something have to do directly with the activation caused by the touch itself? Well, um, yeah, that's a good, good, good question. Um, yeah, because uh, we found this, uh, uh, activity only in the condition uh, where we had touch and pain, okay? We didn't see it only when there was only touch. So we believe that it is something that is related more to empathy between them and less to the sensory, uh, the, the sensory effect of touching. Because if it was only the sensory effect, we would find it also in the, just the touch condition. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, now the question remains. So, so far we examined mostly uh, physical pain in this study. And the question is, what about emotional pain? Empathy is not only um, triggered by physical pain of the of other, we mostly in mo many situations we feel empathy towards emotional pain. Um, another interesting question is what happened when uh, the interaction partner is a stranger and not a romantic couple, because in those experiments we, may, we just always uh, recruit as romantic couples. Uh, perhaps there are other systems for uh, um, feeling empathy. We know that there are differences between experiencing uh, empathy to uh, strangers versus um, people we know uh, for in-group members versus out-group members. Um, another question is, what about other responses? We only focused on hand-holding and touch, and, and there are other empathic responses that do not involve touch. And the question is if it behaves differently or similar to what we modeled in the empathy for pain experiment. So we recently designed a new paradigm that uh, address all these questions, the emotional sharing paradigm. And in this paradigm, um, we ask participants to verbally share a real life distressful emotional event uh, that occurred to them in the past uh, for several minutes. And we ask the other participant to listen carefully to the, uh, to the story. And we, uh, uh, videotape those interaction and we also measure um, their facial expression to see if they are synchronizing their body movement and their facial expression. And we have a control condition where they are asked to share 
uh, a neutral condition, something that just happened to them yesterday with no emotional uh, valence. Um, we use those uh, together with Ilanit Gordon, who's using this um, uh, uh, movement uh, analysis. We found that indeed there is more uh, synchrony in the emotional condition versus the control condition, suggesting that there is uh, uh, um, that when we share emotional uh, stories, there is high level of synchrony between partners as compared to a neutral condition. We are also now analyzing um, their facial expression, uh, a method that allows measuring um, movement of each part of the face, and we are looking for synchrony uh, in their facial expression during the interaction. And we are also using now FNIRS to measure brain-to-brain uh, -brain synchrony in regions that are related to the observation execution systems, such as the IPL and the inferior frontal um, gyros. Um, and we hypothesized that similarly to what we found in the empathy for pain paradigm, that the behavioral synchrony, face-to-face, -face, uh, facial expression synchrony, movement synchrony, and brain-to-brain -brain synchrony will predict um, emotion regulation such that higher level of synchrony predicts uh, reduced distress following the emotional sharing of um, the target. So, um, if until now, Oops. Most model of empathy looked at empathy as a feed, as an open loop, target experiencing distress. Uh, empathy, uh, the distress triggers an emotional um, empathy or cognitive empathic reaction in the empathizer. This new paradigm allow looking at empathy as, as a feedback loop, uh, where this empathic reaction also triggers some behavioral manifestation like mimicry, touch, um, other, we have other uh, experiments on uh, cognitive empathy where we label the emotion of the target or choose an, emo an effect uh, strategy of emotion regulation. And this behavioral manip manipulation uh, uh, serve as a feedback back to the target, which help him or her to uh, regulate uh, the distress of the target. So this new view of uh, empathy looks at empathy not as a, a one shot reaction, but as a, a behave, dynamic behavior with feedback. Um, how much time do I have to... You have another 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. So, um, so as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, we see that empathy uh, is not only a behavior that we see in diets, but we could also see empathy in groups. And we know from the animal kingdom that uh, synchrony not only occurs in dyadic interaction, but also in groups. And, see it across the animal kingdom in schools of fish and flock of birds and uh, herds of mammals. <clears throat> and of course, in humans, we see uh, a lot of group synchrony when people are walking, when people are singing together. And uh, in the lab, we thought to examine whether uh, uh, group synchrony is impaired in individuals with high autistic traits. We know from uh, uh, the literature on autism and autism spectrum disorder that uh, these individuals show impairment in imitation and synchronizing. And, uh, and there are uh, reports that uh, high, uh, individuals with high autistic traits are, uh, uh, have uh, difficulties in imitation of others. And we thought to examine whether individuals with high autistic traits uh, would show uh, impaired ability to synchronize. So uh, we designed in the lab a task, a computerized task that um, involved uh, four participants. Each participant is represented by a colorful circle. And we had computer all connected to um, uh, one a computer. And we see this is the synchrony uh, condition. In the synchrony condition, we ask participants 
to um, move together in synchrony. You see the four, four participants are moving together like a flock of bird. They are synchronizing their movement. Okay. And we had also a spontaneous or free condition where we just told them to move freely on the screen. Okay. We also measure the level of autistic trait using the AQ scale, the autism, uh, autism spectrum quotient. And uh, we use uh, three measures of synchrony uh, that have been used to uh, analyze uh, flocking behavior in birds. Um, one is directional synchrony, which is basically changing the direction of movement. Uh, to, uh, to the near neighbors. The other is cohesion, the, which is basically the distance between one of the fish to the other, one of the participants to the other. And separation is how much uh, um, they um, separate from the other to avoid collision with the other members. <clears throat> so we recruited the 136 participants and we measure the level of autistic trait and we can see here nicely that uh, participant with low autistic trait, we, we divided them to uh, low versus high autistic trait based on the AQ scale. We see that participant with low autistic trait uh, were better at synchrony and cohesion and separation as compared to those with high autistic trait, both in the spontaneous synchrony condition and in the intentional synchrony condition. Okay, so, um, uh, but this effect was uh, much stronger in the spontaneous uh, condition, suggesting that um, individuals with high autistic trait are uh, uh, particularly impaired in their ability to synchronize uh, spontaneously, but not when they are instructed to um, synchronize. Um, we further uh, examine this, uh, uh, examine, use this task to examine brain-to-brain uh, -brain synchrony using FNIRS. So we use the same task only here with dyads. We use an FNIR system to measure brain-to-brain -brain synchrony in the inferior frontal gyrus, which is part of the observation execution system. And indeed, we see we use the like, three blocks. Uh, of uh, intentional condition and a control condition where they just move with a circle that was randomly uh, controlled by the computer. And we see increased brain-to-brain -brain synchrony in the inferior frontal gyrus compared to the uh, control condition. And finally, this is the last experiment that I will show. We, this is a behavioral experiment. We um, used a task of drumming with triads, family uh, consisting of a mother, father, and a child diagnosed with autism. So in this experiment, we thought to examine whether individuals with autism are able to synchronize the uh, movement or during drumming with their parents. So we recorded uh, 23 dyads consisting of mother, father, and a child uh, at the age of uh, four to five. Um, we measured first the uh, um, mother sensitivity to the child in a free play paradigm. And then we measure synchrony in a controlled drumming paradigm where the, each participant was given a, an iPad and they had to drum, uh, to use the iPad as a, as a drum and we measure the number of presses, how much, how, and, and the rate of presses on the iPad. And we measured number of coordinated presses on the iPad. We had three conditions, a free drumming condition, instructed drumming condition, and condition where the child was uh, instructed to lead the synchrony. And we see that when we measure number of coordinated presses, uh, the highest uh, now level of coordination was in the instructed synchrony condition versus uh, as compared to the spontaneous synchrony and also when the child led the movement. So we can see that 
that basically triads with the child uh, uh, diagnosed with autism are able to synchronize their movement. And when we uh, analyze the dyads, all the dyads uh, that consisted uh, um, uh, that, uh, that consisted of the triad, we see that the highest level of synchrony was uh, with the mother and father versus the father, child, and mother, child. Okay, so parents are well, better at synchronizing their movement as compared to their ability to synchronize their uh, drumming with the child. And finally, we found a significant correlation between the mother sensitivity and a triadic synchrony, such that highly uh, sensitive mother uh, were perhaps better at regulating uh, the emotions in the situation and uh, pre this predicted a higher level of triadic synchrony. So um, for future direction, we are now um, further uh, examining empathy as a feedback loop with uh, models together with Dr. Uri Herz from my department, uh, using uh, models of reinforcement learning to see whether empathy can be learned during interaction using feedback. Uh, we are also focusing on other types of psychopathology, not only autism, but also uh, depression. And um, finally, I encourage everyone, I know that with the coronavirus, it's very uh, difficult to examine real life interaction in the lab and everyone is uh, going uh, online. But uh, we still encourage using a, a real life paradigm uh, that allows examining behavior, diet, and groups in uh, real life social interaction. We see here in the corona uh, uh, how it is difficult to uh, carry out social interaction, how much uh, this interaction is important for learning, how much in, uh, the lack of interaction uh, perhaps uh, impairs uh, our ability to learn and interact. So I hope that uh, in the near future, we'll be able to um, go back to uh, uh, establishing a platform that allows uh, examining real life interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. That's a very interesting talk. Um, let's see if there are any questions. I also urge uh, students to ask questions. We always end up with uh, questions by uh, professors. <laughs> I have a couple of comments, if uh, allowed. Go ahead, Gary. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you're familiar with the work of uh, William Condon, uh, going back to the 1960s. Um, no. If, uh, Condon was a clinical psychologist uh, working in the uh, Boston area who was looking at children playing in playgrounds. Mm -hmm. And what he was interested in doing was looking at um, the amount of interactions that each of these children had with each other when they were in the in-group as compared to when they were on the out-group. And the ones that were in the in-group were actually oscillating at the rate of around five hertz, which mm -hmm. is actually equivalent to the standing cortical rhythm of children, mm -hmm. as opposed to adults doing the same thing um, where, their standing, where their frame by frame analysis indicated that way they were moving at the rate of 10 hertz, which of course relates to the mu factor, uh, the non-varying um, signal in the EEG. The point of that was that those children who weren't who, in the group, that, who were in the out group, um, were out of phase with all the other children. So one of the points that I'm raising is, might not be a bad idea to take a look at the phase relationships between the EEG signals that you're getting. That's point number one. A second application of the same thing that you're looking at is also associated with the Japanese art of swordsmanship called Toate, where there were telemetric EEG recordings of people in dyadic relationships with each other. And the winner of the bout uh, remained standing, whereas the second person who lost the bout lost motor, motor tone and fell to the floor. It's quite a an amazing thing to, to actually see this, but there's a nice literature on that particular topic as well. Third point I wanted to make in this fascinating lecture of yours is, uh, unfortunately, not very long ago, until the 1980s, there was a, an operative procedure called a cingulotomy, 
um, where the cingulus gyrus was cut in patients with uh, intractable cancer on their way out. And yet these patients still felt pain, but they didn't care. So it's that particular pathway, that connection of caring, or uh, even if it related to, their, to themselves, that also has a piece to this overall story that you're painting. And with that, I will stop and... Yeah, actually the anterior cingulate is known to be part of the emotion, the, the part of the emotional pain. How we experience pain is aversive and not the actual physical uh, dimension of pain. And even in empathy study, we see that the activity in the cingulate um, is shared by both the target experiencing the pain and the observer who observe the pain, we see also activity in the cingulate. Right? This is the part of caring about the other person and, and experiencing the aversiveness of pain. And Daddy? Uh, yes, hi, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. I have uh, two questions. One, one maybe following uh, what uh, uh, Jerry uh, proposed and uh, the second more provocative. Uh, I think that uh, it would be very interesting to follow, uh, you have the data, not only to see if there's circularization, but to see which is the leading. And for this, you can use, uh, as suggested, the phase relation is a little bit more sophisticated analysis. And I think it's a, it would be almost trivial to do it, and it um, um, can add a lot of information. The second question is more provocative because we convince you convince us that there's a lot of uh, synchrony all around us in in our life in animal kingdom, and the question is why. Uh, and I try to figure out first if this is uh, only unique to biological system, or it's general. So I wonder. My question is. If somebody uh, tested, um, for example, a school of fish, uh, if the uh, interaction there can be modeled by uh, thermodynamics, uh, uh, saying that maybe synchrony is uh, reducing entropy or something like this. So first to see if this is some uh, unique to human, to living uh, creature, or it's a general phenomenon. Well, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's probably a general phenomenon. You can see it in all types of uh, animal creatures, and not only in mammals, you can see it in uh, fish, birds, uh, even in viruses and, uh, and microbes. So I think it's, a un it's not unique to uh, animal creatures, but it's uh, probably uh, something that is, uh, has some advantage, advantage in nature. Um, we, we know that uh, synchrony is rewarding. When we do things in synchrony, uh, people enjoy it. People enjoy singing together, walking together, dancing together. Um, so it means that there are a lot of uh, uh, advantages to uh, uh, feeling connection, to feeling together with uh, uh, the group. Um, it creates some uh, cohesion between uh, individuals. And um, there, there are many uh, um, explanations for why it is important. For example, in the animal condition uh, kingdom, it was suggested that it is also it reduce, reduces the uh, risk of predation uh, because um, uh, animals that are um, in a herd, those that are in the middle of the herd are less likely to uh, be caught as compared to those that in, are in the uh, outside of the herd. But outside the, the living kingdom, you know, if somebody tested the uh, synchrony? Um, only in viruses, I know, but not uh, in, uh, not in uh, objects or... Uh... Uh, can I ask him a, a question, Roy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask him a methodological question. Uh, okay. I can't recall the name of the method by which you uh, you, you you measure the synchrony between the EEG nodes in the in this experiment, but there are many methods to 
quantify synchronization between signals. Was there any particular rationale behind the choice of method? And uh, did you, for example, compare it to results in other methods like phase synchronization, cross coherence, etc., etc.? Um, well, we selected the circular correlation method because uh, uh, there was some uh, previous study showing that this was the best uh, type of uh, analysis approach that allows uh, overcoming random correlation between uh, signals. Uh, but we did not compare it to other types of uh, uh, analysis approach. But I know that from the literature, it was, it's con considered the best approach for uh, analyzing brain-to-brain uh, uh, -brain synchrony in EEG signals. Okay. May I, Simon? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank, thank you again uh, for, for a great talk. I'm also going to ask sort of a, I guess, a somewhat provocative question, which is, uh, why do we empathize? Um, and, and I wonder if you have part of the answer there, uh, and if you've given part of the answer, which is, um, we, we can't stop ourselves. Uh, that is, we, fe we feel the pain. We really feel the pain. And you have shown that in a sense, right? We feel the pain when we see somebody in pain. And to what extent really sort of the behaviors and then the, the synchrony that we engage in is actually not to regulate the other's emotion, but it's to regulate our own emotion. And so I wonder if you have, for instance, a paradigm in which you ask the presumed empathizer to not empathize. That is, do not respond in a synchronous way. Do not, you, you're not permitted to behave in accordance with the behavior of the other one. What would happen to the levels of pain of, again, of the presumed empathizer? Yeah, well, actually, in our paradigm, we, we had this condition where we asked participants not to hold the hand of the participant, just to be present in the room. And I can tell you that uh, many of our participants felt uh, extremely frustrated from not uh, being allowed to uh, hold the hand of their partner. Uh, and, and we see that there was lower level of synchrony uh, between them in this condition. I think that each one was uh, regulating their own emotion uh, when they were not allowed to communicate. Um, and I believe that empathy for the, the first part of the, your question is why we feel empathy. I think that it, it is a behavior that we see in all social creatures and it basically, uh, it is basically there to uh, motivate us to help other people regain uh, homoestasis. And, and, and this is why it's also um, uh, uh, distressful for the one that experiences empathy because he uh, experiences the pain of the other and then he uh, attempts to uh, provide behavior, to, to, to use behavior that uh, will uh, allow reducing the distress of the other and this, and in this way he will also reduce his own pain. Now we had a, a, an experiment where we also compared level of uh, empathy to um, negative versus positive emotions because we also feel empathy for positive situation when our friends uh, um, are experiencing positive uh, emotions, we can also feel empathy and we, uh, and be happy with and share their joy. And um, in the previous study, we found that the level of uh, empathy and, and the brain activation was much lower for positive emotion as compared to negative emotion. And, and I think that empathy is much stronger for negative versus positive emotion because, uh, not because we are bad and we feel envy when our friends are, uh, in a good position, but because um, we basically, if someone is in a good position, when he's successful, when he's happy, he doesn't really need us. They don't need to recruit our uh, behavior uh, um, to help them. And this is why we're not re responding too much to the happiness of other people. And we tend more to respond to the distress of other people. So I think that from a, an evolutionary perspective, empathy um, uh, evolved to uh, um, help us uh, um, um, behave prosocially and reduce the distress of our kids. Okay. 
I wanted to say something in this regard. First, uh, okay. I think it was a fascinating uh, talk. Great Thank to hear you. you. Um, uh, so with regard to what Gil asked is so that there are experiments showing that the uh, overcoming pain is rewarding. So like if you associate uh, an order with the end of a pain, it, yeah. it is rewarding. And, and this is also like connected to what you, you mentioned earlier that synchrony is rewarding. And I wanted to ask if in the case of the autistic uh, kids, so do you feel that the lack of uh, the ability to synchronize is related to some kind of uh, dysregulation of social uh, related skills or to the reward systems, to their not receiving rewarding uh, signals from being yeah. synchronized? Yeah, that's a good question. So you, you ask whether the uh, poor behave, the poor synchrony emerges from difficulties in actual synchrony or perhaps just reduced uh, uh, reward signaling. Perhaps they just don't uh, benefit from uh, uh, So I think that the best way to examine it is to um, just do a fMRI study and look at the activation in reward system and also perhaps ask them how they enjoy the, the, the level of... Uh, so actually in the study with the drumming, we did ask them about the level of uh, enjoyment from uh, performing the task. Um, we, we, we saw that indeed they, they enjoy the synchrony, but we did not compare it to, we don't have still a control group for this experiment, so I'm not we don't know if the level of enjoyment is lower or higher than, than control groups. Cool, thank you. I would like to ask a question, can I? Yeah. First, it was very interesting. And I was wondering, uh, as you uh, tested the romantic couples, if there were differences, if the empathizer is a man or a woman. Hmm. Well, um, in the fMRI experiment, we compared uh, the level of uh, empathy of the men and women uh, because we had, we had the, they had both roles, and we did not find any uh, difference between men and women. Thank you. Welcome. Cool. So let's uh, thank uh, Sibon again for this great talk. Thank you. For the... Maybe we can synchronize our clapping here. Let's see if this works. <laughs> we'll all feel better. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Simone. It really, thank really you, Simone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.